Good evening, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney with Pulsinelli. I'm based in San Francisco, California. Tonight, we're going to talk about how to position your startup for a venture capital funding. Really exciting stuff here. We'll talk about what we're going to talk about in a minute. But before we do, uh, please allow me to give you uh, an overview of how tonight's program will run and also sort of the best way to operate. So tonight, we'll, I'll speak for about an hour. I'm gonna pause a few times throughout um, my presentation. And if you've got questions, use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. That's gonna make it easier for me to uh, track because not only am I uh, running, you know, not only am I presenting, but I'm also running all the tech in the background. So without further ado, allow me to just uh, share my screen and we'll get going underway. All right. Now, hopefully that's going to show you how to position your startup for venture capital funding. Let's go over a few ground rules, which includes sort of the general caveats that are important. Today's discussion is general information. It is not legal advice. So we'll talk about a lot today, and we'll talk about um, how you'll approach situations, the situations you may encounter. Please understand that when we discuss them, they are general information. They're, you know, what may work typically, but your situation is probably going to be very fact specific. So before you take what I say, even if you give me a fact pattern, or even if we follow up and have a conversation afterwards, you know, unless and until you're engaged to counsel, uh, it's just general information, not specific legal advice. With that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about myself, or I'm going to tell you what we're going to cover today. Today, we're going to go over my background a little bit. We'll talk about what you need to do for your company structurally to get it positioned to be uh, financed in a venture capital financing. We'll talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of what the documentation looks like around that. We'll talk about the funding stages. So, you know, part of the goal of today's conversation is to give you an overview of the path to venture capital financing. Hopefully that's what you've come here for. Uh, we'll talk about an, a high level overview of common seed financing documents and, and mechanisms, safes and convertible debt. We'll talk about valuation and dilution at a very high level. And then we'll talk about venture capital financings, um, again, also at a high level. And we'll also talk about some common mistakes. Now, one of the things I didn't mention earlier, but hopefully you're aware of, is that we are uh, recorded tonight. So on the upside, if uh, you miss some or all of this, in about a week or so, I'll send you a follow-up uh, email with a, a link to the recording so you can watch it. Downside is, you know, because we're in a public venue, albeit virtually, um, and because it's going to be recorded, please don't share any confidential information because it will not be confidential. Now, so my background is, as I said before, I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney. So what that means is that I work with companies that are venture backed, that wanna be venture backed, um, and I also work with venture capitalists as they deploy their capital uh, into those companies. I've been practicing law since 2005. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I'm with Pulsinelli, which is a 900 attorney firm with 20 to 25 offices throughout the US. And I love working with entrepreneurs. Um, I got that bug. I ran my own shop for a while so I can identify with my clients um, in the sort of struggles that they face in starting a new business, starting a new company. So uh, as I mentioned before we got started, we've got an audience survey here. So what I wanna do is see who's in the room. So please fill out the audience survey if you haven't already. And um, I'm gonna give you a sense for who's here. So we've got about 40% of the room are first time entrepreneurs, 30% roughly, uh, 25 to 30% are serial entrepreneurs. We've got 30% in early stage startups as I'd sort of uh, say kind of up to a level, if you will. 
Um, scale ups, which I would consider to be at you know Series A, and B, and maybe even C. We've got some folks from a large corporate, and we've got some investors in the room. So a good mix. And uh, let's see where folks are from. So we've got a strong contingent from the Bay Area, um, another strong contingent from elsewhere in the U.S., and then we've got folks uh, in Europe and Asia. And one of the cool things, again, is because this is recorded, people can sign up all over the world and um, they'll get it if they can't watch it tonight or right now, we'll, we'll see it in the future. So I got to share those with you. And I want to talk sort of big picture. Um, and talk about sort of the way that I see this particular world, which is when you're talking about growing companies, you're talking about, at least from a legal perspective, making sure that you're getting all these various inputs tied into the company, You know, whether that's capital, which is coming from the investors, whether that's ideas, um, which are you know, from the founders and other, other folks who are working either as employees or consultants in the company. And then you know, there are other folks who've got, who bring technical skills to the company. So you wanna tie all those in and what we would call paper them. That is, document those relationships in paper um, in terms of legal documentation. And when you do that, and then you add a little bit of capital, maybe not a little bit of capital, probably qu quite a bit of capital if we're talking about being in the venture capital space, you can get these companies to grow. Uh, and let's just take a, a quick picture at what, uh, or a quick glance at what a startup financing life cycle looks like, right? So at the very beginning of the company, there's no revenue. And in fact, actually, um, there are, it, it can be negative, right? Uh, you, can be, you can be burning a lot more cash than you're bringing in. And so those initial sort of, that initial period of time, which can actually be quite long. I mean, everyone sort of seems to think, oh, all of a sudden you'll be able to, um, you know, flip the lights on and go out and raise a bunch of money because there's a bunch of money sloshing around. It's not true. You know, that sort of seed stage when you're building the initial team and the initial prototype, that can, that can last a year, two years, three years, five years. It just sort of depends until you start to cross that uh, corner and you, you've got your prototype, you're maybe starting to get some initial sales, there's some traction being demonstrated in the market. And kind of then is when you are really out typically raising venture capital to grow and scale that. In terms of structural considerations, when we talk about this, we, at least here in the United States, we typically see companies setting up as a Delaware C corporation. Now, the reason why we end up seeing companies set up as a Delaware C corp is that, um, sorry, I just wanna make sure that this, okay. The reason why we see companies set up as a Delaware C corp is because we see the, the investors, um, demanding it, uh, essentially, right? So there are a couple of reasons for that. First and foremost, in Delaware is known for its corporate law. Now, the reason why it's known for that is a, a few factors. One, the, the state of Delaware has made the conscious decision that they want to have corp incorporation or corporations incorporated in their state, so they've set up their laws to make them business friendly. They also have the Delaware Chancery, which is a very... Um, sophisticated pool of jurists, that is a court, uh, that uh, is very familiar with business issues. So the sort of thought being, if you're incorporated in Delaware, you've got a great sort of statutory law to, to look at and use, and then you've got a, a set of judges who are familiar with business issues. So you know they're more apt to come to an appropriate decision in, in you know, depending upon whatever the, um, whenever the, the dispute is. Now, the other thing too, that you're also kind of looking for is because you've kind of got that volume of, of data, um, to the extent you've got a dispute, someone may have had one that's pretty similar to what your dispute is. And so you can look to see how that was resolved and that can hopefully kind of resolve disputes before they escalate to lawsuits. Now, there are a few other mechanics kind of dovetailing with that, which include the fact that typically, uh, Delaware has more protections for the directors and officers of corporations. If you're going to have a venture capital fund uh, invest in your company, it's very likely that at least one of the funds 
that's investing is going to want to have a board seat. Um, so they want as much of a liability shield as they can possibly get in place. And then sort of the fourth and final plug is typically the Delaware Secretary of State is great. They process things quickly. Um, and that is just a pleasure. It, it makes it so much easier to do deals, whether it's fundraising or a, a merger or an acquisition, uh, to get things done, not get tripped up on that administrative side. Uh, and as I mentioned, seed funding is the period of time or is that sort of initial fund that you get sort of maybe initially from some friends and family members and other folks who you know, um, up through various angels so that you can get your capital and put it together, uh, put together your prototype and get your initial team there. So I'm going to pause there and see if we have any, I'm going to actually um, pause there, see if we have any other questions and then kind of move on. Again, if you've got questions, uh, please use the, um, you know, please use the Q and A. All right. Uh, someone can't see their microphone. Uh, at this point, we're just taking questions via writing. I heard nowadays the intangible asset is worth eighty percent of the big, huge corporation. That's probably true. I mean, it's certainly in. It depends on the business, um, but absolutely, IP, other intangible assets are are, are huge. Um, when it comes to pre-revenue startups, what do VC funds look for in those, and how to find those how to find those funds are willing to invest at that stage? Um, and then for someone filing in Delaware, okay. Let's save. This is a great question. I'm going to come back to it in terms of how to find funds. Um, someone filing in Delaware, a third-party service, what works best? Something like LegalZoom. So. Look, I'm, I'm not going to be in a position to endorse any third party service. I will say, um, you know, there are services out there that tout themselves to being customized and tailored to um, venture back companies. Um, so without endorsing any of them, you know, I know Clerky is sort of one of them that they're trying to crack into this space. Um, I think Stripe at Atlas also does. I have not heard that Zoom is doing that. Um, I don't want to say anything sort of positive, negative on that, only that those resources are out there. Is seed funding the same for B to B and B to C? Um, I'm going to take that question and I'm going to say that this, like many things when we're talking today, are sort of generalities with fuzzy edges, whether it's a sort of a series C financing, series A financing, um, you know, uh, the, the borders are somewhat amorphous around there. So uh, just keep in mind that when we're talking about these things, uh, you know, I'm giving you sort of general concepts and you got to kind of dig in the details to know exactly if it fits into that bucket. Um, great question. Does, must a company change from a California corporation to a Delaware corporation for BC funding? And what is the fee to switch? Uh, so I would say the majority of companies do switch. Um, it's not, it's not a hundred percent of them, but I would say like the vast overwhelming majority do. And the fee just varies. I mean, if it's super duper early and it's just one, one person, I mean, you may even just sort of restart. If you've got a couple folks, you know, a few grand, to maybe low sort of five figures um, and then up, 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 up from there. All right, done. How do you decide to call what the initial external funding round is, seed versus pre-seed? Uh, so going back to the sort of theme that we're giving general concepts and kind of a lot of the stuff is fuzzy, the, the reality of it is, is there's a lot of branding that's going on, right? Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, there's a school of thought in terms of signaling. What are you signaling to the marketplace? How, you know, um, how successful will you be? And so there's from a branding perspective, if you will, sometimes raising a big seed or a big pre-seed looks better than a big seed, even though everything that's being done is exactly the same on the legal side. Um, 
if you're incorporated in Australia, so this will be my final question. And then I'm going to use that to sort of dovetail to a couple of other comments. And then we're going to, we'll move on and we'll answer questions th throughout the program. If you're incorporated in Australia, for example, what implications does that have for VC funding in the United States? Uh, well, it just sort of depends. VCs will fund Australian companies just as they will fund European companies. Um, if you're going to make a concerted effort to be here and build a team here, then you know you may may need to do a corporate inversion and basically have the company re-domesticate here to the U.S. So the answer is it just sort of depends. Um, but certainly, you know, there are certain VCs who are willing to invest in Australian companies or other companies, um, you know, in other countries. All right, so. Dovetailing off of that, in selecting an entity, what typically drives it there are investors, but we look at a few other things, right? We, we take a look at um, the tax implications of the structure. We take a look at what the management structure needs to be for that company. Earlier, I mentioned about how if you're going to have venture capital funding, the VCs are probably going to want to put somebody on your board. Um, we also talk about whether or not you'll be giving equity incentive uh, incentives to your employees and other service providers. C corps generally lend themselves much to better to that, and than an LLC. It can be done with an LLC. It's just typically more expensive to do that. Um, and we think about exit exit strategy. All right. So, moving on, you got the entity right, right, which is critical for sort of first step. Then, what are the other things that you need to get in place? So, if we think about my image a little bit earlier and tying all these inputs into the company, <clears throat> all the intellectual property needs to go into the company, right? So there are IP assignments in place between all the founders, employees, service providers, developers, you know, outside third party contractors. You got to make sure all those agreements have got the IP in there. Certainly at least the material IP, you know, um, and that is material being the, the IP that's necessary for the business to carry out what it's in its plan business is going to be doing. Uh, another big issue is vesting. So that is making sure that, especially the founders, you know, they if one of them were to leave early, they don't walk away with all, uh, you know, their entire equity stake. They only walk away with the amount that they had earned to date. That's what we call vesting. Now, I think vesting is a little bit of a misnomer um, because you know we sort of think of vesting as kind of giving you your shares of stock over time, but mechanically it actually works a little bit different than that. Um, the folks basically buy all of their stock at one at once. Okay, usually for especially for founders at a, at a very nominal amount because the company's not worth anything. And that stock has got strings attached to it. And as time goes by, a string gets cut. And so uh, if that person were to leave, uh, you know, the company pulls on those strings and gets that stock back. Uh, so that's, that's what vesting is. And there's some other issues. If we've got time at the end, we can talk about including 83B elections and important things like that. Another issue is just making sure that there are transfer restrictions in place. So who's on the cap table is a very important uh, issue for companies. Um, you don't want to have a competitor on your cap table, let's say. You don't want to have too many unaccredited investors on the cap table because it can be, make it difficult to do deals, uh, you know, a merger and acquisition in the future. Um, and so, you know, that's another critical component is making sure that all of those uh, vesting, excuse me, all of those transfer restrictions are in place. So we've got a company, we've chosen the right kind of company. You've gotten the IP secured. You've gotten the equity secured, right? Those arrangements, the, the vesting, which we've talked about. Um, you need some money so you can, you know, pay your team, and pay your rent, and be able to go out and uh, build that prototype, right? So most of the initial funding mechanisms that we see kind of fall into the convertible security realm, at least with regard to venture-backed companies. And to just 
maybe pause there and sort of distinguish a venture back company from a company from a traditional small business or from a traditional middle market company. Um, a venture back company requires a lot of capital, millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions to grow and scale in a particular time window. So from when that venture investment, that first venture, that first real venture investment comes in, I'm not talking about angels. I'm not talking about friends and family, but I'm talking about from, from traditional funds. You know, it's, the company is raising that capital so that that VC can exit within roughly seven years, seven to 10 years. And, and the reason for that is because of the structure of the venture funds, which they're, their plan, their path, their strategy is to, you know, raise money from their limited partners, their investors, deploy that capital over a number of investments, a wide number of investments. And from that, they're going to get all the return that they need to fulfill the promises that they made to those LP investors uh, from just a couple of winners, a couple of really big winners. So when we're talking about this financing path, you know, we're talking about needing millions and millions and millions of dollars to grow and scale, to take advantage of an opportunity. Either it's, um, you know, potentially a, a creating a new market or being able to disrupt an existing market. Uh, and so what we see here are these convertible securities, which are convertible notes or safes. Now, convertible, these convertible notes, also known as convertible debt, uh, also known as bridge notes, um, we'll walk through what, the, what their factors are in a second. But basically, uh, it's a note. It's a promise to repay, kind of like your car loan, kind of like your house loan, only it's all due at the end. Um, and the, but the real upside here is not coming from the debt. The real upside here is that that debt converting over and into equity, a very equivalent equity to what the VCs will be getting when the VC round gets done. And that's different than price rounds, which are those series seed and series A, which we'll talk about briefly later, but I've got a very much more elaborate, um, you know, how to do a venture capital financing discussion rather than how to position your company to do a venture fin financing uh, discussion. So let me just take a, Peak. Okay, so we got a good question. Uh, shouldn't have just launched into the jargon without sort of defining things. What does a safe stand for? So a safe, a safe stands for a simple agreement for future equity. Um, for those with a business background, it's basically kind of like a forward contract. It's basically people prepaying at a discount to get shares in the venture round. And that was safes were um, safes were developed by Y Combinator, which is an accelerator out here. Yep. Uh, yes, within a week or so, so we got a question about getting a copy of the webinar. Yes, uh, within about a week or so, I'll send you a copy. Um, we've got a, a question about uh, only being one founder, should equity vest immediately or should I vest over a period of time? Great question. I kind of, great question. And here's how I, I sort of view that. Um, it sort of depends on when you think you'll be doing uh, a round with a sophisticated investor. Now, I say sophisticated investor because that might be an angel round. It might be an accelerator that you're going into, or it might be a VC round. I don't know who the sort of first sophisticated investor that you know you would raise money from. But if you've got a sophisticated investor, you're probably going to need to subject, you very likely need to subject your shares to vesting if you haven't, if you're fully vested already. Um so then the question is, do you do that now, like when you form, or do you do that? later. I think it's, it depends on the situation. Sometimes in some situations I go one way, in some situations I go another, but suffice it to say, if you're going to, if you're going to do it immediately, it's with the, 
hope and the not the hope it's with the goal of basically creating a psychological anchor so that when you talk to that sophisticated investor you say well yeah i'm already vesting i've already subjected my shares to vesting and here's where we're at let's not restart the clock the concern is if you just wait until the end and wait until their investment is about to come in and then subject your shares to vesting they're going to make you restart from the beginning um when I invest in a C corp, do I receive a K one at the end of the year for tax purposes? Nope. K ones come from S corps and and LLCs. Um, so, getting back to convertible securities and talking about convertible debt. So, the so the main the main terms here uh, I fleshed out, um, and the main ones that that relate to convertible notes, that is convertible debt, have got little asterisks on them, and we'll we'll unpack some of these in a minute. But convertible debt unlike a safe, has a maturity date. That means that's the date that you got to pay the money back plus interest. It's got an interest rate. That convertible debt also has an interest rate, just like your, if you've got a car loan or a house loan, you know, um, it's an interest rate. And typically sort of four to 8% is what we see. Then there are conversion terms, which we'll go into um, a little bit more. Uh, and then there are terms that, that relate to the amendment of these instruments. And this is something you do not want to overlook because one of the issues that you can get yourself into if you've issued a bunch of safes or convertible notes, let's say you're, you're buttoned up against that maturity date. I mean, sort of typically, you know, it's 12 or more likely 18 to 24 months on a maturity date. What you're going to want to do is think about when you're going to raise the price round, which would make the note convert and give yourself some extra runway, right? But let's say things happen, it's taking more time. You may need to amend that note to push, excuse me, push back the maturity date. Um, if you've got to get the permission of each note holder, you know, from whom you've raised that money, then uh there's a high chance you won't be able to get all of them and one of them will come due and theoretically they could force you into bankruptcy or you know force basically the end of the company or, or extort some terms or um, some much more investor friendly terms uh, than they would otherwise be entitled to. So making sure you've got the right amendment provisions are pretty important. And then uh, there are some remaining terms in these things which we negotiate, but they're kind of, less frequent. And I guess maybe one other pro tip, if you will, in one sense, safes are relatively standard. Now, safes as a, a form and an instrument has changed pretty significantly circa September, October of 2018. Form basically really changed since then. Um, it's fine. We can talk about that a little bit later in today's presentation. But, you know, because safes come from sort of one source, in one sense, they're kind of standard. Now, everybody kind of makes a few tweaks here and there, and that's fine, um, as long as you pay attention to what they are and they're not a problem. Convertible notes, however, uh, there is really like no standard out there. Um, the nearest you can maybe get to it is, you know, some accelerators have sort of put forward their own standard forms. Like I know 500 Startups has done that, you know, for a while they were super popular, but there really is no standard with convertible notes. So you got to make sure that you're looking at each one of these pretty, um, pretty closely. Now, as I said before, let's, when we were talking about convertible notes, people are not buying convertible notes because they're interested at the, in, because they want the interest at maturity. They're buying convertible notes because they want their investment to convert or change into preferred stock when you do a preferred round. So what we always see in there is a, is a mandatory conversion mechanism. And what we see is typically, you know, if you do an A round or a series seed round of some minimum size, the note's going to convert over either at a discount, right? So if it's a 20% discount, basically, if the new money, the VC is putting in money at a dollar a share with a 20% discount, the note's gonna convert over at 80 cents a share. So every 80 cents of 
uh, principal and interest, that's outstanding. They'll get a share out of that. A conversion price cap is another very common mechanism that founders read, about, uh, read a lot about and get very confused over. Um, a conversion price cap is really meant to provide an extra bonus discount. So above and beyond that sort of 20% or, you know, um, if the company is able to get a lot of value and juice out of the investment that that initial, that early stage investor put in, right? So, you know, if you, if there, if I am a super angel and I put in a million dollars to the company and as, you know, and as a result, the company doesn't need to raise capital uh, until it's got a $50 million valuation, let's say. Well, you know, I'm going to only have a teeny, teeny, teeny slice of the company, uh, even though I put in that money that made it necessary or enabled the company to just explode the value of, of the business. So a cap would basically say, and there's pre-money caps and post-money caps. And we'll talk probably a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, you know, let's just say you had a $10 million cap and it was on a pre-money basis. Well, then, you know, reading the fine print, making sure, you know, you got to read the fine print on these things. But sort of as a rule of thumb, I'd roughly have 10% of the company at least before that new money comes in on that financing, which is a lot more than I probably would have had if I just had a 20% discount. Um, conversion price caps are sometimes used as a value of the company, um, but that's but they're not really a true valuation of the company. And we can talk more about that uh, later. Again, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q and A, not in the chat, because I've got about five different windows open to run this thing, and it's I can only look so many places. I want to try and do as good a job as I can. Um, sometimes we often see a conversion upon a change of control or sale of the company, right? So again, if the company gets sold, um, maybe the convertible note holder would be better off if they've got equity in the company, right? So that's what that's there. And then, um, sometimes we also see optional conversion upon a maturity. So you hit the maturity date, you don't extend the note, and then the note gets converted into either, you know, shares or whatever is the most senior um, form of equity that's out there, whether that's you've already got uh, preferred stock or maybe you've, maybe it's just common. Okay, that's a lot of information in the weeds, but it's, it's pretty cru crucial. So decision points. Uh, more typically, so we end up with securities, convertible securities for a few reasons at this earlier seed stage. Um, that is because they are less expensive to do. There's far less uh, kind of legal diligence involved and far less negotiation and, and wrangling over corporate document or you know investment documentation. Also, you avoid having to value the company early on. And um, many founders want to value the company and they want to see the value of their company grow. But one of the real issues that happens when you when that that happens at that point in time is, man, it's hard to tell what the value of an early stage company is. It's hard to tell what the value of sort of even a growth stage company can be, right? Um, but especially early stage companies where you don't have any revenue, um, if you are um, a founder and you value you know, the company too low, then you've potentially sold too much of the company at too little a price and vice versa. You know, if you're in the investor and you value it too high, well, you know, uh, you, you're, you're losing money. So convertible notes, safes have a mechanism that delays that valuation until the series seed, series A, that price round. And then the downside, at least for convertible notes, is that convertible notes is debt. So it's got to get repaid at some point or it could trigger that bankruptcy issue, which I mentioned before. 
Um, and then as a heads up, if you look at the preference stack, that is who gets paid first, you know, at a sale or some sort of other liquidation event, you'll see debt, you know, secured debt holders are at the top, unsecured debt holders, then preferred shareholders, then common. So that debt's going to sit above the common holders, that is the founders, if the company uh, gets liquidated. All right, let me just pause there and see what kind of questions we've got. How often does an investor want a conversion cap? I, I would say, I don't, I can't tell you that I've like tracked the, um, I, I looked at a number is like about a month ago or so. I mean, I, I would say, if not the majority, like a huge chunk, really, really common. So you can have a note with, you got all, all different kinds of flavors, right? You can have a note with um, a conversion cap. You have a note with a discount. You have a note with a conversion cap and a discount. You can have a note uh, with neither. And then you can also have a note with like a most favored nation clause, which would basically say like, if you issue a note to somebody who's got better terms, it th those terms automatically get um, read into and, and get amended into this note. <coughs> I'd say I do notes all the time with both conversion caps um, and also discounts. They're just super common. I wouldn't bat an eye on any of that. If you're a founder, it's kind of a little bit better to have a discount only because, you know, again, if you can uh, really grow that company with the amount with the money that you raise, uh, you're gonna end up with less dilution. So Again, also kind of going back to that hypo, which I mentioned before, uh, you know, you could end up in a situation, right? So if that note holder um, gets a huge chunk of the company, not a huge chunk, but gets a larger chunk, chunk of the company, I mean, that dilution is coming out of, um, coming out of the relative ownership interests of the note holder, excuse me, of the current cap table holders, which would be the founders and employees and other stuff. No, other folks like that. Let's see. All right, we've got another good question about angels and VCs. We'll talk about that later. Can a convertible security be repaid by cash without the conversion? Um, so many times they've got a feature in it where they cannot be repaid early. It cannot be repaid yeah, they cannot be repaid early because again, what the investors are really interested in is getting that equity, that preferred equity. Uh, what is the typical convertible size? For example, 200. Uh, it honestly, there is no, um, there is no true standard. Uh, in this sort of realm, I think what an entrepreneur needs to do is take a look at what the transaction costs are to making sure that you do that convertible note financing or that safe financing correctly. Um, and also weigh the burden that each additional investor puts in that round, right? And from there you figure, yeah, raising $5,000 from 50 people is really much more work and gonna erode a much larger proportion of the raise than if I raise, you know, uh, two, uh, if I raise $125,000 from two investors. It's more paper to chase, more legal diligence to do. Um, that's kind of what should, should uh, drive that question. What are the going terms of preferred participation in the event of a buyout? Um, so I think what Mark is, is interested in um, is the preferred being able to participate along with the common. So when we're talking about a liquidation preference, as I mentioned before, we're talking about who's getting paid first. So I think Mark is talking about, or this, this individual is asking about um, whether it's participating or not participating, right? So 
in that world, sometimes, you know, you can get a one or a two or three X or even greater, but very rarely liquidation preference, or you can, or you can be treated as common, or you can get, uh, you can get both. Um, so you can get your liquidation preference and then also convert over and get treated as if you were paid in common. And that I think is in the minority of deals um, these days, although not crazy. You just, Part of what it depends on is how much market power you have and whether or not you can set different terms. Okie dokie. Um, I'm going to move on because I want to get into the basics of, of dilution and valuation. So almost two months ago, I did with uh, Supporting Strategies, which is an outside CFO consulting firm, I did a presentation uh, with those guys articulating and identifying the basics of dilution and building pro forma cap tables. If you're interested, please let me know. I would be happy to send you a, a link to that so you can watch it. I think it's instrumental and also very critical because, you know, when we're talking about safes and convertible notes, and then when we're talking about, a, you know, the preferred round, which is what we're talking about today, like, you know, how to position your company to get there. You need to realize that each one of those financings, first and foremost, you are selling a chunk of your company. And the only way to know how much of your company you're selling is to run a pro forma cap table to see, yes, I've sold these notes on these terms. And if I do this kind of preferred financing, this is how much of the, you know, and by this kind of preferred financing, I mean, this is the pre-money valuation. This is how much I'm raising. If I do that, this is how much of the company I'm going to own at the end of the day. And I know from working with a lot of entrepreneurs that how much of the company they own at the end of the day is absolutely critical for them. So let's talk about a little bit of terminology before we kind of wade into the basics of valuation and dilution and how they interact. So pre-money valuation, and look, there are, again, as I mentioned before, You'd like to think all these terms are absolutely 100% standardized, but you'll find you got to read the fine print on all this stuff. But by and large, when we're talking about pre-money valuation, we're talking about the value of the company before the next round of investment. So that is right up until that wire gets pressed. You know, that, that by wire, I mean the transmission wire of the money into your company. What is the company worth? And then the post money is simply the pre-money plus the new money that's come in. Sounds easy. So let's take a very, very, very simple example. And we're not going to include other things, which would include, you know, we would typically include in there like option pool and equity that's maybe been issued to um, uh, landlords or, or other folks like that. If you've got a company with a $10 million pre money valuation and there are 10 million shares outstanding split among three founders equally. I guess I should really have put 9,999,999, but anyway, if each founder has got 3,333,333 shares, uh, they've got 33% of the company, right? If the investment that's coming in at that point is $3 million, then the, the price per share is gonna be a buck a share. That's the pre-money valuation, $10 million, divided by the number of shares that are outstanding. And the post money is gonna be what the value of the company was before, plus the new investment, so $13 million. So, you know, you can see after that, that round, you know, the founder still has, founder A still has 3,333,333 shares, or roughly 25% of the company. Now, um, if we're talking about also adding in sort of the loop here, which is if there had been a, a $500,000 convertible security with a 25% discount, then I'm sorry, uh, my son is getting put to bed in the background. And so it's very distracting to hear him uh, cry. Let me just move this over here. Uh, the, the holder would have received 666, excuse me, 666,666 666 shares of shadow, shadow series. 
And if there had been a $500,000 convertible security with a $5 million cap, that holder would have received a million dollars of, excuse me, a million shares. Now, let me break down to why that happened, right? So if we're talking about a discount, then what would have happened is if the new money is paying a buck a share, the convertible note holder is going to get converted over at 75 cents a share, which is how we went from having you know $500,000 worth of a convertible security into 666,000. So that's simply 500,000 divided by 0.75, you know, 75 cents to get that number. Um, similarly, if there had been a cap, well then what would have happened is instead of doing $10 million of pre-money valuation divided by the 10 million shares, it would have been a $5 million pre-money valuation divided by 10 million shares. So it's 50 cents a share. So that again, that $500,000 in convertible security that is outstanding gets converted over by dividing by that 50 cents a share. And that's how you get to that, um, that million there. So just kind of continuing on with this hypothetical and ignoring the fact that, you know, we, we kind of threw in the hypo of these convertible notes or these safes. If, you know, the $3 million that comes in allows the company to hire some more entrepreneur uh, uh, engineers, hire, start to hire a sales team and are off to the races. The company is doing like a lot better. It increases in value because now you've got some real revenue. Um, and everyone sees, oh my gosh, like this company's ready to scale. At the next rounds, let's say this company has got a, a pre-money valuation of $30 million. Well, in this case, again, ignoring the fact that there'd probably be an option pool and ignoring the fact that some other shares would have gotten issued to some other people or some warrants might be outstanding. If it was just simply those initial founders and simply that new money, which we just talked about, those... 3 million shares, well then um, the price per share would have been the new pre-money valuation, which is $30 million, divided by the 13 million shares that's outstanding or $2.31 per share. So if you then take that investment, which would have been $10 million and divide it by that you know, dollars per share, you're gonna find out that the new money, this, this sort of series B in this case, is going to get 4,329,000 shares. And you will see that founder A has gone from having a third, you know, a third of the company to 25% of the company to 19.2% of the company. And you'll also see that, you know, the value of the founders shares has even the, you know, has increased, right? So their stake was originally worth when they first started might be worth a couple bucks, right? But that first financing, it was then worth a third of $10 million. And, and now it's worth, you know, 19.2% of $40 million, uh, which is 7,699,000 and change. So hopefully that's been helpful. Let's see if I can take some uh, questions at this point. We got some Q&A. Great. We've got someone who's interested in the valuation video. Um, send me an email or respond to the email when I send you this recording, and I will send that to you. Okay. I think these questions should wait to the end. So let's talk. So today's goal, right, is to talk about how to position your company for a venture capital financing. So we've talked about the kind of company that you're probably going to need, that Delaware C Corp. We've talked about making sure that you assiduously connect all of the inputs. You connect all of the IP, all of the employee relationships, all the equity relationships. Make sure you've properly documented all the fundraising that you, you know, the funding that you've received, right? Via the safe or the convertible note. It's probably the right mechanism. Um, let's, let's talk about what you need to be thinking about as you're positioning yourself for your venture capital financing. You gotta find the right investors. Um, and this actually holds true for the angels too. You know, 
I've started saying, and I don't know if I'm going to keep saying this, but I've started saying, you know, money is fungible, but investors are not. You know, the right investors, ideally, the right investors will have played in your space, but not invested in a competitor, right? Um, but they'll play in your space so they'll understand your market. Um, they'll understand your business plan, which you're going to need to articulate to them to convince them that, yes, if you put money, if they put money into your company, they're going to get that return that we talked about earlier today, right? So that they can get the returns on their portfolio to make their LPs happy. Um, they're hopefully going to also be able to help you out on, on either the operational side and or the recruiting side and or other strategic relationships, right? So, you know, either they can sometimes act as talent pools, that is, they know they've got contacts, right, in terms of engineers and other folks who, who can get plugged in to help you get your team up, built up quickly. Um, and or they, they know potential customers, right? They've got ins in potential customers or suppliers, right? Uh, and with that, they may be able to add quite a bit more value than if they're just money um, and even more so than if they're solely focused on their immediate return. Um, because if that's the case, you know, inevitably in the in part of a company's life cycle, it's going to face a tough time or two or three or four or more. And if that happens, you want someone who's got the stomach to weather the course and also help you weather the course. Now, how do you find them? This goes to a question. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, Obviously, going to events like this is one of them, but you know, don't forget that between sort of Crunchbase, PitchBook, TechCrunch, there's a lot of information out there. I mean, these days you're pretty much able to uh, find data on anyone who's seriously playing in this space, and you can then look at you know what what segments do they make investments and what what verticals. Where have they invested? Um, what what stage in the life cycle are they focused? Um, so I'm going to try and knock out a couple of questions with that. I got a question that talks about kind of angels versus VCs. Again, sort of fuzzy borders, but they play by and large in different spaces. You know, angels traditionally. Angels play in a much earlier space before, you know, as the initial team is coming together while that first prototype is being built out. Traditional VCs really play um, after you've got not just a prototype, but you've, you've got sales. Um, because what they're traditionally focused on is deploying capital, a lot of capital, so you can grow and scale and then they can get an exit you know, an IPO or an M&A in, in that sort of seven to 10 years, which we talked about a little bit before. Now, fuzzy borders. I say that because, you know, now there are micro VCs, there are super angels, there are groups of angels, and they kind of, some have kind of caught up market, others have kind of come down market. So results may, may vary, um, but they usually kind of play in different spaces. And how you find them and come across them is sort of the same, right? So you can Start putting together your, your list of, of who you think might be a good investor, right? And then you want to learn about them. You want to know the other investments that they've made. You want to make sure that, you know, just because a fund plays in a space doesn't mean that um, every partner at that fund plays in that space. So you want to try and figure out which partners have what expertise and then try and get a warm intro to them. Now, ideally, you're going to be doing this early before you need to raise money or you want to raise money for them. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, they are people and they are going to be more apt to make an investment if they know, like, and trust you. Um, they can build that, that trust if they've known you for a while, seen how your company has evolved, seen you go through some hardships, seen you come out the other end stronger. Um, that's, that's why. 
All right, I'm gonna knock out a couple of questions with this real quick and I'm gonna take a sip of water. Principal differences between appealing to angel and VC investors. Again, so VCs by and large, we're talking about traditional VC funds. They've got investors, they got hit returns. That's what they're focused on. Um, and also coming in typically at a specific stage. Angels, lots of different things motivate them. Sometimes they've, you know, they're successful entrepreneurs that know a sector and they want to give back. You know, other times they just kind of want to get in on some hype. Um, but they're not, they don't have investors to whom they are beholden. So their motivations are quite a bit different. All right, let's take a look. So in venture capital financings, you need to understand what's in the, like a term sheet. Okay, so that's the right investors. Let's talk about what's in term sheets. So if you want to see kind of a typical term sheet, you can go to the NVCA um, website, nvca.org, I think, or nvc.com, nvca.com, I don't remember which, or you can just Google NVCA financing documents. And they've got a model term sheet and you'll see it's robust, it's very long. That's got all the bells and whistles that you'd see. If you read it, it's probably gonna be Greek to you. Don't panic, that's okay. Um, what you wanna do in positioning yourself for venture capital financing, before you go out and raise, you've got your counsel who's focused in this particular area, not just any old lawyer, not any old business lawyer, but you want a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney. And you wanna build with them you know, you want to take a look at and build that pro forma cap table so you know how much of the company you're selling. And then you want to walk through and put together kind of what an ideal term sheet is going to be from your company's perspective. So that when you're out there having conversations with VCs, kind of as you're getting close to making that ask or raise, you're going to hopefully end up with a term sheet, two or three, ideally, that you like um, and um, that work for you. So, and traditionally, it's the VC that puts together the term sheet and gives it to you, but it's always a conversation, right? It's a conversation about valuation and what's important and who's on the board um, and maybe some other protective provisions and other things along those, excuse me, along those lines. All right, because we're coming close to the end of the hour. Um, I think at this point, I'm gonna take as many questions as people would like. And then I will work in these sort of bonus common pitfalls if we don't have enough uh, questions to fill up the time. Let me, and just let me pause real quick to just take a drink. Sorry, I've had a very good but long day today. So my energy level is a little bit lower than normal. Um, okay. Great question. Can a founder get preferred equity for the initial cash put into the company, i.e. founder capital contribution? The answer is yes. Um, but, you know, what is the preferred gets you that early? I don't know. For a while, there was this um, concept called founders preferred, which you may sort of see on, online, which was put together by Founders Fund as if I remember correctly, it was about 2012 or 2013. This was sort of in vogue for a little while. It was not used very frequently, but the idea was you put that in place right away and then you can sell that to the VCs instead of their traditional, it would convert over to whatever the VCs were buying. Um, and that would allow a founder to get some liquidity a little bit early. Again, didn't really seem to, to take off and, and no one really seems to, do that these days. Okay, J uh, Jason, you said that a note could have conditions or a safe could have conditions such that if you, somebody else gets a better deal, those conditions populate the earlier note. This sounds pretty sweet for a founder if say the first note has a 6% interest rate and the new one, oh, <laughs> and the new one has a 3.5%. Oh, so the most favored nation clause that I was saying was with respect to the investor. So that's that's like uh, protection for the investor. It's not protection for the company, unfortunately. Sorry about that confusion. If a startup has no income and no customers, but it has a product, like a software application, 
what is the best way to find out the value of the company? Well, there are some things you can do. Um, if it's really early, it's pretty hard to do. I mean, usually, uh, sometimes the glib advice that I give, not trying to be glib, but comes off a little bit glib is, you know, the company is, what was I going to say? The value of the company is whatever you set it at. Okay. Which basically means, you know, whatever you're willing to, to part with that 20 or 30% of your company at that A round, um, it could be less or it could be more than that at the dollar value. That's what your company is worth. And that's honestly what it is. So the best way to kind of value it is probably, you know, get your ducks in a row and then test the market. Now you can, you could theoretically uh, talk to someone who does business valuation and maybe they can help you do that. And I've talked to some of these folks before and they're very bright, um, but do not confuse, you know, what somebody who's a, who does business valuations or appraiser is gonna tell you with what's gonna clear in the market. Because at the end of the day, it's whatever you agree upon with that VC especially if we're talking about a company that's got no income and no customers. How many VC firms are asking for a business plan versus a comprehension, a comprehensive deck? Um, so in my experience, it, look, it sort of depends a bit on the stage that the company is in. Um, but whether you provide a business plan or you have a series of conversations where you un articulate what your business plan is, they absolutely want to know what your plan is because that's what they hook into to, uh, you know, to track to see whether or not you're credible and they're going to get the return that they need in that period of time that they need to get that return. So I find most VCs want to have a short, short deck either you know, before you have a conversation with them or to go through when you have that initial conversation, just from a smell test perspective. But if you're really engaging in serious dialogue with them, they're going to want to know what your business plans are. Because again, you know, early stage companies, they're investing in the team and they're investing in your ideas, not just the tech, but your, your, your plan to bring that tech to market and make it a commercial success in that seven to 10 years. Now, I keep saying that <clears throat> uh, life science companies and other, other companies in highly regulated places, uh, highly regulated industries um, might have a different path or portfolio, right? Because you, know, you can't just go out and start selling um, artificial hearts, you know, just off of what's coming out of your workbench. Um, but by and large, that's, that's good advice. Can a company do both a crowdfunding and a VC company, a VC funding at the same time? So um, we get the crowdfunding question a lot. We just don't see it coming up very much in true venture back companies. Um, VCs again, the, the notion of controlling who's on your cap table, you usually don't want to have a whole bunch of unaccredited investors on your cap table. And so VCs usually stay away from it. Not always, but uh, I, I remember doing a panel with three VCs on it. And I said, well, what do you guys think about crowdfunding? And they're like, we don't, we won't touch a company that does it. Now, those are just those three. Uh, but those, those two things are usually kind of alternative paths. Is seed or pre-seed too early to spend time and money on specialized attorney to build a pro forma cap table? Uh, well, you, so there are some online resources and if you, you know, uh, you can just Google pro forma cap table venture back company and there are some places that will put out, um, there's a group in Texas uh, S8 maybe, S8 Ventures, something like that. Um, it's helpful. It, uh, you know, I would take a look at something like that. You know, Carta's got some, some tools. So you, you don't need to hire 
an attorney to build the pro forma. I mean, usually, you know, we either have somebody who's a paralegal or sort of a case assistant person building these. It's not me doing them, although I do come back and double check them. And sometimes I have to build them. Um, so I wouldn't, that I don't view that question as being correct insofar as I wouldn't hire, you know, I, I would hire a specialized attorney to give you counsel and advice to navigate the issues that you're your company is facing and, and moving forward with, I wouldn't hire them specifically to build the pro forma cap table. You got other resources that you can at least get an initial quick and dirty um, sense for. And then, yeah, you should absolutely, you got to work through the cap table with your attorney before you actually do the financing. But just to do sort of like a, the build, you, you don't necessarily need to do that. If I'm investing into a C-Corp as an individual, what collateral should I expect from the owner as evidence of my investment and share? Okay, so if we're talking about venture cap, venture back companies, again, usually if it's early stage, we would see a convertible note or we'd see it safe. We would not see a personal guarantee um, from, the, from the founders, certainly not out here in the Bay Area, not through most of the US, I've seen them outside the United States. We usually push back really hard against them and get them removed if it's going to be a true venture back company. If you're moving out of that realm, I can't, you know, uh, this is not the, you're not in the right venue. <laughs> I'm not going to be, anything kind of goes. So I won't be able to answer that question any further than that. I, I will say, you know, sometimes people want to have common stock. Uh, the issue with that is it sort of sets the value or arguably sets the value of the common stock so that if the company wants to issue equity to its employees, um, they may need to issue it at that price. And that can lead to some, some problems. So again, usually we see a convertible note or a safe. Do most VCs start as angels? Is angel investing a good start to become a VC? I understand it takes time. That's a great question. Um, I, I don't, in my experience, and it's just my sort of limited experience, you know, you know, we see, I wouldn't, I don't see it very frequently that they are kind of climbing from angel, like climbing up the rung from angel to VC. I see them kind of being previously successful founders. Maybe they do some angel stuff, but then they get involved with a fund or they've got, you know, they've been working in a PE capacity or they've gone to school, you know, get an MBA or something along those lines, or they've got other technical expertise. So I don't typically see, you know, folks starting out as angels to, to then climb and become a fund, it does happen. I mean, I have seen, I have come across it, but I wouldn't say that's like the most, in, in my limited, limited experience on this, I would not say that's the most common path. I think um, what you could do is maybe, do, you know, call around, see if you do an informational interview um, with those VCs and, or you could, um, yeah, I don't know if there are any other resources that where they sort of disclose how to become a VC, but there might be other things that you can find online. Can you offer different terms to different investors in the same round? Great, great, great question. So um, in one sense, yes. In another sense, you know, these investors are gonna be along for the ride for seven, 10 years, especially if they're early investors, maybe longer than that. So, you know, you gotta treat them right. I think typically treating people right means kind of treating them equally when you're talking about, you know, a particular point in time. And it's true. Um, folks who make big investments, maybe they do get some more bells and whistles. Maybe they do get um, some warrant coverage on top of their note, or maybe they do, you know, maybe they do get an observer seat or they get some pro rata rights, um, you know, versus a, a smaller investment, like a $50,000 investment instead. Um, but you know, typically we wouldn't see that coming on the sort of cap discount side of things. Um, and, and again, they're, you know, one, you want to treat them right. Two, 
one of the things you do need to be mindful of is what you're saying to these people, right? Because what you're saying to them is what's motivating them to make a purchase. If you kind of tell everybody that you're treating them all equally and then it you know, turns out you're not, well, then you've misled them. You could open yourself up to securities laws <clears throat> claims, among other things. One second, sorry. Um, there's an anecdote indicating that Carter will value uh, the company at a penny a share for a very new company. That's right. So Carta has a valuation service uh, connected into it. How long does it take for capital to transfer after terms are agreed upon but not signed? Um, well, I'm. Let me give you a couple of scenarios because it sort of just depends. I mean, uh, as a, from a lawyer and lawyer's perspective, we want all the documentation done before the money changes hands, right? Because there's nothing worse than um, ending up in a position where the money needs to get given back or there's some uncertainty. So, uh, you know, if you're just doing a deal with one investor and you already know them, you might be able to get that deal done in a day. Uh, but, you know, more frequently, even with convertible note and safe rounds, we usually try, the most effective thing is to drive a process. That is, know how much money you're raising in the aggregate. Know what your general terms are going to be, that discount, that cap. Um, know what your minimum raise from each investor is going to be so that you can try and drive this so that all everybody sort of closes at the same time. Now, in one sense, it might take a little bit longer than closing a note here and closing a note there. But in another sense, it's usually less expensive than doing that rolling closing. And bear with me just one second, because I want to, uh, the sun's going down here and I want to turn the lights um, on. Bear with me one second. I think that looks a little bit better. Um, and if we're talking, okay, so convertible note rounds, safe rounds, typically take a couple of weeks, and uh, but they can stretch on for months. What is the typical VC investor? More VC fund than individuals? Um, yeah, so Tom, what, what I'd recommend you do is just, you, I mean, go on to, if you want to figure out who the VC investors are in that particular industry, just go on to Crunchbase. And you, can, you can look it up by industry. Okay, what happens if startups get money from non-accredited investors? Great question uh, with general applicability. So one of the issues here is making sure that the company complies with all the security laws that are out there. So you may think, oh, I've got a small company, I've got a startup, I don't need to comply with the securities laws here in the US <clears throat> and each state within the US or, and or the securities laws of other countries if you're raising from outside the United States. And that's not true. You need to make sure that you target an exemption. Um, there are, at the federal level here in the US, if you're raising money from accredited investors and you, 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 know, you are able to uh, check a few other boxes, if you will, uh, there are a lot of exemptions that are available and they preempt state law. So it makes it less expensive to do a deal. To, to get it done. There's less transaction fees associated with it. If you don't have all accredited investors in there and you can't check, or you can't check all those other important boxes in terms of a pre-existing relationship or something along those lines or other things along those lines, um, you know, you didn't, you did a general solicitation. Um, you have to look to see whether or not there are any other exemptions that you can re rely on. Um, if you've done a general solicitation, that is you've just sort of blasted the internet or you've you know, blasted on the radio or you've kind of gone outside of your network, um, you know, you may need to wait six months before you can do a raise. Anyway, let's get back to the unaccredited investor question. 
Um, having unaccredited investors typically increases the uh, expense of doing a raise, which nobody wants to spend more money on that. And then additionally, once they're in the company, to the extent you need to do a reorg, that is have them exchange their current securities for another for a different security, or you want to have uh, your, your company is going to get acquired by a private company, privately held company. Uh, again, those that privately held company is going to want to have accredited investors on its uh, cap table. Otherwise, there are additional information burdens, uh, which again drives up uh, transaction costs. So that sort of in a nutshell is why you don't want to have unaccredited investors on the cap table. I mean, and additionally, if you have what like two thousand unaccredited, you know, if you've got other bad things can happen if you've got them on there. Uh, where can we find angels? So idea to IPO has a lot of events in, including, you know, how to pitch to angels. So I, I would consider, you know, I think these days in COVID, you can kind of find many of the, these folks online. You can also look them up on Crunchbase to a certain extent. Again, best thing is to figure out who you want to meet and then see if you can get a warm introduction there. Uh, would investors take cryptocurrency instead of shares? Uh, they did that a few years ago, and that's kind of fallen out of favor, I think, by and large. Um, and, and I think if you play a lot in the crypto space, I do a little bit, but not enough. Um, they may There may still be some who are interested in it. Great. Okay. Question. Is there a sunset date associated with 83B elections? Again, I'm not really sure what a sunset date means, but I will tell you, going back to vesting um, and going back to sort of first principles, which is, you know, the IRS wants to get paid the tax that it's owed when you receive something of value. Um, and the IRS takes the position that you know, while we're talking about vesting and getting all those shares with strings attached, the IRS takes the position that basically you don't receive those shares until each of those strings have been cut. That is, there's no longer that substantial risk of forfeiture. As a result, you know, that founder may have paid a penny a share or a fraction of a penny a share for the stock, but that stock may not vest until three years later, four years later. Some of that stock may not vest until three years later four years later. And um, at that point, maybe you've done a raise, maybe you've done two raises. And the, the, let's just say the shares now the, are now worth 10 bucks a share. So you know, at that point, because you've only paid a penny a share and the, the stock is now worth $10, $10 a share, there's $9.99 .99 of, of gain that you're receiving and you're gonna have to pay tax on that. The 83B election allows you to elect to prepay that tax when you, you know, buy the shares effectively. And so, you know, when those, um, when the restrictions get cut, that is the strings get cut, you don't have to then pay for it in the future. Now the catch with the 83B election is you got to file it within 30 days <clears throat> of when you buy the stock. So if you don't do that, you miss the window. And, you know, unless you're still really pretty early stage, you can end up in a, in a big, big world of pain. I hear that VCs are less likely to invest in your company if you do not have a partner. Is this true or fact? Uh, I would say some VCs will have uh, an outright rule that you need to have a co-founder. Not all VCs are that way. Um, I think it's helpful to have a co-founder because I think it's a little bit of a tell. Well, let me take a step back. Again, what VCs are doing, especially for early stage companies are, are betting on the team. And, and so I think probably to the extent they've got those rules, it's probably driven by a concern that, you know, if no, if no one else will work with you or partner with you, why should they partner with you? Um, I think if you, can demonstrate why that's not an issue, um, they'll be interested in investing in your business. I mean, I have clients who are single founders. I've got clients that are 
husband and wife. I've had clients that are, you know, uh, just friends, of, you know, so all, all types of folks are out there. Build the business and they will come. When do VCs usually invest usually? Again, so after you've already got sales in the market and like what's, what's constrained, you know, so that they can come in and take a look and say, yes, what's constraining you is not, do you have the right team? It's not, do you have a good product? It's you need capital because the market wants to buy everything that you're selling, all those goods and services. That's when they usually come in. So that is, you know, again, you've got a product in the market and you, you know, your constraint is, is you just need more money so you can get more product out there to sell it. That's what they're ideally looking for. In a seed raise scenario, do angels expect entrepreneurs to negotiate terms? Try and understand the typical power in early, with early stage entrepreneurs and investors. Yeah, so early stage, seed stage, usually it's the company that puts together the terms that they want, you know, that they, that they're seeking and they run the process, which is different than the, the venture stage, which we talked about where the VCs will, will provide you with a term sheet. Um, okay. Any advice for a new high-end, high-performance, advanced engineering brand, which intends to manufacture hypercars and introduce innovative next-gen tech. No, that's, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking for questions of general applicability that I can answer. Um, looking at the chat, although please use the Q&A. Uh, starting your corporation in other states. I mean, usually the VCs will make you reincorporate in Delaware, but not always, but typically. Again, what you have to understand is as excited as I get about legal when it comes to venture capital financings, um, what you want is your company's legal structure to be plain vanilla, right? You want the VCs to be spending their time and, and, and energy on evaluating the business, not evaluating your legal structure. Uh, how do you know what to go after during startup phase? Angel round or just go straight to series A? I mean, I think it's going to just depend on the company with regard to that. I think um, what's important to remember is that financing, whether it's angel financing or venture financing, is a means to an end. Okay. And the goal is not to raise a bunch of money to raise a bunch of money. It's to raise a bunch of money to do stuff, specific things with that money so that you can dramatically increase the value of your company, right? And get to that next point where you need that to get it to the next level after that, you got to go out and raise a bunch more money, right? Until you mature. So in the question of raising an angel or just go to A, I think what you need to do is think about what does what the growth path of your business look like to maturity? And um, what's the better use of your time? I mean, the other thing too, to think about, and I we sort of talked about a little bit before is, you know, you, you, do, you do a price round early, you may be saying at the value of your company at the wrong amount, right? So you may be selling way too much of your company, right? Because it's too early. Nobody knows exactly what's going to be valued at. Nobody knows whether or not the market's going to like what you're doing. So I think that's the analysis that needs to get done. When discussing patented product with VCs, should NDAs be given? Um, it's going to need... That's going to be totally fact dependent, and I'd want to bring in my IP or patent counsel for that. I think the issue is, by and large, VCs will not sign NDAs 
because it's their job to kind of know what's going on in the market. Um, additionally, that's not true in all spaces. In the life sciences spaces, they will they will frequently do that. Um, and there are other spaces where they will do that. Uh, but by and large, they won't do that. So, you know, the real best line of defense, though, is, I mean, I think, look, having an NDA is great. Um, but before you even get to that level, you know, can you provide a high level summary or information on what it is that you're doing so you can start to get comfortable with them and know that, they're going to treat you and treat your confidential information properly. They're not going to just take it out and give it to one of their other portfolio companies that's a competitor. So I think that's, that's what I have to say on end. That's my sort of stock information or stock answer on, on NDAs and why you're by and large not going to be able to get VCs to sign them. There are a couple exceptions to that. And don't just think about, oh, well, I've got this NDA, I'm protected. Because the reality of it is, is if they violate it, then you got to sue them. And if you're an early stage company, you don't have money to sue them. So you're kind of up the creek without a paddle. Uh, so instead, what you should be thinking about is, is you know, can I give high level information sort of initially, um, get comfortable with them. And then once they're interested, you know, if we got to get into the weeds and stuff, then maybe we approach this on this, uh, on this NDA level, even if you can't get them to do it on the outset. Um, so again, on, on patent questions, I always loop in patent counsel, but I will also, so we've got a question, which is like, how important is it to file a patent before searching and working on getting VCs and angels? Um, again, always bring in patent counsel, but one thing you may want to consider, which I frequently find that first time entrepreneurs are not aware of is that although a true patent is very expensive, there is a stopgap. Uh, which is a provisional patent, which is orders of magnitude less expensive to put together and to file and will allow you to reserve a filing date. And so one of the strategies that you or we would work together on is, okay, maybe it's time for us to, to file our provisional patent, which will give you, I believe it's a year, you know, before you actually have to file that patent. And then you can, you know, you could say we've got provisional patents on this, we're raising the money so that we can pay for patenting among other things. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, so I, with that in mind, we're kind of coming to a quick close. Um, let me just see if there's anything that I wanna just touch on. Um, so I'm getting an email. Look, one thing I didn't mention is that I keep office hours. So I'm always happy to have a non-confidential informational conversation with entrepreneurs to just try and give them the you know, sort of more targeted, but still general information. So if you're interested in that, send me an email and we'll get something set up typically Friday afternoons. Um, so th this individual, Michael, has sent me a couple of messages. Michael, I'd welcome a conversation with you. Um, with that in mind, uh, I think I'm going to close out today's program. I want to thank each of you for attending. I want to thank idea to ipo for organizing and for hosting. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, a venture capital emerging growth company attorney. I hope you enjoyed today's evening, uh, today's event. Thank you. Have a great evening and get back to building your great company. Take care. <laughs>